part three. So, book of Galatians, going into chapter four. See how much we can get accomplished here. I really don't want to just race through this because it's important that we absorb what the scripture says. Let it minister. Let us get understanding on these things so that, I mean, these truths out of the word of God will set us free. And I mean, once you learn something in the scriptures, it's really hard to unlearn it. And it's really for your profit. The more that you know, I mean, like I said, the Bible says that, you know, it's through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that this, this knowledge we're supposed to grow in and we will grow and peace and grace will be multiplied to us the more that we understand the word of god so let's just get into it this is galatians chapter 4 it says now i say that the heir okay as long as he is a child does not differ from a slave though he is master of all but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father so think about it, like, let's just pretend that you are, I don't know, let's just use the Lion King, everybody knows the Lion King, let's just pretend you're Simba, alright, and so you're supposed to be the next king, you know, but when you're a small child, you know, you might as well be the same as, you know, the servants, you know, you're... Now, you're right, you are the master of all, but until that appointed time for you to inherit the throne, you know, you're you're kept, you know, by guardians. I mean, anybody who's watched any movie of, you know, royalty, you know how it is, you know, it's just like you're getting bossed around, you know, by these chauffeurs and butlers and, you know, all these teachers and tutors, yet, like I said, your your placement in the kingdom is already predestined okay so he's making an analogy here and it says so even so or it says even so we when we were children okay we're in bondage under the elements of the world okay but when the fullness of the time had come god sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoptions as sons. So understand this. This is one of the big takeaways here. There's many big takeaways here. Um, I think partly because my mind was so glued on, you know, aliens from a long time ago. This is one of the verses that helps me understand, you know, that even in the book of Hebrews, it talks about Christ came to redeem you know, those that were under the sin of Adam, okay? The fall of Adam was very unique to the planet Earth. And it literally impacted the entire world. Death did not exist until the fall. So this whole idea that dinosaurs died way before man existed cannot be true according to scripture. Now, if you don't believe the scripture, that's fine. But if you believe the Bible, you have to understand that death did not exist. Animals did not die. In fact, there was not even such a thing as a carnivore until sin entered the world. And so what I'm saying is, is that Christ came to redeem those who were under the law. That's one of the reasons why he had to be born of a woman and he had to be born like flesh and blood yet again his work did not do anything for fallen angels did not do anything i mean if he was if he came on this earth as a spirit being as you know in the likeness of like an angel it would have done human beings no good and his priestly ministry would would not even exist because yet again Jesus became a human so that he could suffer all the same things. He suffered he suffered betrayal, he suffered hunger, he suffered tiredness, he suffered physical pain, he suffered uh temptation, false accusations. He went through all of the things that you can go through. 
as a human being so that he could then become a high priest. The Bible says that that um, that he can basically relate to us having you know been tempted at all points just like we have yet being without sin but he's able to he's able to comfort us and he's you know he's it says that you know he can't be touched you know uh by our, our infirmities like saying that everything that we've suffered he's been through it therefore he totally gets it he can relate to us now god almighty you know sitting on the throne eternal you know, without death, not being able to be tempted. Okay, that, that in that form, he would not be able to relate to us, okay? But, because I mean, think about it. God doesn't have to use the bathroom. God doesn't have to take showers. God doesn't have to, you know, do all of the humanly things that we have to, you know, feeding ourselves and, you know, resting our bodies and stuff like the eternal God has no need to do any of those things. So he had to become like us to redeem those that were under the law. And that we might receive adoption as sons. So what was the whole reason for Jesus coming, dying on the earth? His whole plan was, okay, the adoptions as sons. Okay. Also, also realize this because yet again, this is something that it is mentioned in scripture, but it's not explicitly mentioned enough. Think about this for a minute. Okay, if we need to be adopted into the family of God, okay, if we need to receive the adoptions as sons, all right, so if we weren't in the family of God before, what family were we in? Okay, if we need to be adopted, out of something who were we sons of before the answer is we were sons of the devil okay the devil wants to kill steal and destroy the bible says that by nature if you read in the book of ephesians that we were we were children of wrath even as others okay the, okay satan is the father of lies notice every man is a liar even children they lie you know, I mean, I know there are some kids that have a sensitive conscience and all that. But what I'm saying is, is that we are all guilty of sin. And children, I mean, are, trust me, just talk to any school teacher that has been a school teacher for 10 years. All of the destruction, all of the lying, all the deception, all of the self-will and self-pity and all this stuff. I'm telling you. We were children of the devil, okay? Even what Jesus told the Pharisees, he says, you are of your father, the devil, okay? And those were some of the most religious, allegedly God-fearing, you know, religious organizations to exist on the face of the planet while he walked on the earth. And he referred to them as children of the devil. So that's just a little... That's just a little scriptural look. I mean, I'm not saying people should say it with hatred in their heart. Like, oh, you're a child of the devil. You know, you're, you're, you know, the spawn of Satan. Okay. However, scripturally, they are accurate. I mean, of course, you can speak truth without love. But speaking the truth in love, I'm saying that the scripture does teach that, okay, Satan is the god of this world. The whole world's under a curse. And before you are adopted into the family of God, you're technically a part of the devil's family and you are a you are fulfilling his will, which like I said, he was a liar and a, and a thief uh, and a murderer from the beginning. And this world is full of hate. Uh, it's full of, of lying and stealing. I mean, I mean, you, you know some of the common phrases, you know, the whole, you know, it's it, the world. It's, it's a, it's a dirty world. You know, you gotta, you gotta play dirty to to win. And I mean, you see how ruthless, you know, politics and just everything in this world is just corrupted. And humans are corrupted. And so, you know, like father, like son. Okay, 
we used to be children of the devil. So I'm just that, that that's it on that. I mean, I'm just just letting you guys know this is something that I've understood through studying the Bible. Some people don't know that. I, I understand it's offensive, um, but it is a spiritual reality. So it says, uh, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son and your hearts crying, Abba, Father. So much to say even in this one verse. Okay, first of all, you became a son upon believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and it says God has sent you forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So the adoptions of sons occurs first, then the spirit comes in that order now granted it could be like a five second difference between the time that god accepts you as a son and then he sends the spirit but regardless that is the order in which things happen according to scripture okay and it's so so we have the spirit of his son with the spirit of christ okay the holy spirit and it says that he sent his the, the spirit of his son into into our hearts crying abba father now unless you've had this experience for yourself this scripture is not going to resonate with you as much this scripture resonates with me very deeply it is the inner witness of the holy spirit okay at one point in my life didn't have the holy spirit but when the holy spirit comes you know that you are a child of God. There is no question about it because his spirit bears witness with your spirit and it cries out, Abba, Father. And this is, I mean, honestly, this is so loving and so passionate that I'm sure, I mean, if I talked about it and thought about it and meditated on it too long, I would probably end up crying. But I'm telling you that when the Holy Spirit comes, literally your spirit literally just cries out to god and you just feel the acceptance and the love of god that he has for you as his child think about think about the same and i'm speaking to you parents okay particularly mothers would understand this okay the intimacy that a mother has for her infant that unfeigned unconditional pure just straight love that a mother ought to have for their infant child okay that same love can be felt and it can be reciprocated and what i'm saying is is that god is god is love god is the author of love and you can feel that powerful love radiating from the heart of the father to your heart and you recognize it because the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart. There's no question about it. Any born again believer who has received the love of God in their hearts, they understand this verse. You have to experience it for yourself when your heart just cries out because God has poured his love and has poured his spirit and the Holy Spirit is bearing witness with your spirit. You are accepted in the beloved like I said, you've got to experience it for yourself. I can talk about it all day long, but talk to any spirit-filled believer. They get it. And when you get it, it changes you. It wrecks you. It turns you into a little puddle of just mush. You know, I mean, trust me, I used to be one of the most, I don't even know some of the words to try and describe myself. I just, I used to have a heart of stone, but in that moment, God will give you a heart of flesh. All right, and it says... Um, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. There's a lot of things that are mentioned about slavery. Okay. The Bible says that, uh, Jesus Christ himself said, so it said that, you know, whoever sins is a servant of sin. You are a slave to sin. Paul talks about in the book of, book of Romans. He also makes mention of this, that you are sold you know, into slavery by sin, you are a slave to sin, you, you cannot, I mean, yet again, none of us have the power in of ourselves to make it so that we are no longer sinners. 
we just can't do that. Because think about it. I mean, if we could do that, then... Yeah, then there would be a bunch of people that are roaming around the earth that are just sinless. But as it is, no, it's a spiritual reality. Every single human being on this planet is struggling with sin. Now, it might be varying different degrees. You might think that somebody's sin is worse than another. But the point is that we all fall short of the glory of God. And every single one of us deserves death. Because of our sin, because of our transgression. You break one law, you're guilty of breaking them all. And it says, um, so you're no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. This is something that's also, it's very meaningful because, all right, it is very, it is very easy to get stuck in a servant mentality where God is your boss, you are his employer, and you know how some people are with their boss. You know, they're trying to please them. They they mean well, you know, but there's this weird gap because it's just like, you know, you're my boss. I'm the worker. It's, it's kind of this slave men master mentality. And, uh, and there's no freedom, you know. And it literally is the difference between if you, if, if your father was the boss, okay, there would be a totally different attitude. You know, you would be more relaxed, you would be more comfortable, you know. I, I guess it depends on who your humanly father is. But you understand that the, the dynamic would be radically different. And so, understand that God looks at you as a son who serves, okay, but you are not just some God slave, God servant. Yes, yes, you are a servant. You know, God, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve he taught us to serve. He washed his disciples' feet. You know, he said, let the greatest, you know, among you be the one who serves uh, the most. And so, yes, we are called to serve, but he served with having his identity, his identity not as a slave, not as a servant, but his identity as a son who serves. And trust me, I've fallen into to the whole slave mentality thing you know, trying to please God, which is great. There's nothing wrong with that. But you can get so wrapped up in it that you don't end up feeling loved by God. And so your identity needs to be founded upon your sonship. This is so important. Um, honestly, you can never renew your mind enough to this. Um, it says, uh, but then indeed you did not know God. You served uh, those which by nature are not gods. Okay, so idolatry, the, the church in Galatia, they, they were idolaters. It says, but now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored I've labored for you in vain. So they were going back to the Old Testament laws where there are a lot of festivals. There are a lot of um, holidays. There are a lot of new moons and special Sabbath days. And so they were trying to be obedient to every meticulous part of this law. And it says, brethren, I urge you to become like me for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject. But you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So, little background context, okay? You got to keep in mind, Paul was getting stoned. He was getting beaten. He was getting whipped, okay? I mean, they were just having a heyday with Paul. He he went through a lot of physical abuse. And so when he came to the church of uh, Galatia, he was not, you know, he had, you know, plenty of scars. And, um, you know, uh, he, he had some pretty fresh wounds that he was dealing with. Um, yet, like I said, they still took him in. They still listened to him. Um, and they, they still, like I said, uh, heard his message gladly and it says what then was the blessing you enjoyed for i bear you witness that if possible you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me okay so 
a lot of people trust me this this scripture has been torn apart and twisted in every which way okay but long story short you've got to understand think about it if you are stoned i mean this is literally people throwing rocks at you and people are throwing rocks at you and yeah they're going to hit you all over the place and so just imagine that yes paul had black eyes he was bruised he was beaten up he didn't look like he was doing so good okay just keep that context in mind when you're reading this okay and it says um have i therefore become your enemy because i tell you the truth they zealously court you but for no good yes they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them okay and he's talking about yet again earlier in the chapter he's talking about these um jewish people jewish you know believers that were basically saying like look you, you gotta if you really want to be accepted of god you have to follow the law of moses okay so it says um it is good to be zealous in a good thing always and not only when i am present with you it says my little children in whom i labor in birth until christ is formed in you I would like to be present with you now to change my tone for I have doubts about you. Um, this honestly, this this scripture always just rings out in my head. Sometimes I'll just, it'll just come to mind. Um, Paul says, you know, in verse 19, it says, My little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Like, sometimes I feel that way, you know, like, I see believers and, you know, they might be stuck in a particular sin or whatever the case is. But sometimes I will feel this deep groaning. And it's not it's not condemnation. It's, it's none of those things. It's just like, I see the church and I know what's possible in Christ. I know the liberty. I know the freedom of sin. I, I, like, I know what is available to every believer to walk in peace and joy, the power of the Holy Spirit, to be performing miracles, healing the sick, casting out devils out of people. And I see them struggling, you know, condemning themselves or stuck in some, you know, sin that is holding them back from being on fire for God. And it's like, I pain on the inside. It's like I travail, like I'm having labor pains because I want... I can't wait for Christ to be formed in them already, you know, and I know that, you know, growth is a process, you know, and everybody has, to, these things have to happen organically, but at the same time, I still feel that in my spirit, man, I'm just like, like, oh, I can't wait until, like, all of this clicks in you, and you can just be set free, and like, just, you know, and this is one of the reasons why I do what I do is because I do hurt for the body of Christ. Those, I mean, I pray even if there's one person that 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 this touches and affects and something clicks in their head, something. I mean, one verse, one word from God can change the rest of your life, and so that's why I'm in the scriptures all the time because I'm a living testimony of this. So it says, um, it says, tell me. And this is where he breaks it down. It says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law. Okay. Those who want to be under the law of Moses, trying to do everything that the law of Moses says. It says, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. The one from a bondwoman. Okay. And the other who was born according to the flesh. Okay. It, it says, for... He who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. Okay, remember Abraham, it was it took about 13 years before Isaac was born to Abraham, even though God had already given him the promise, like, look, you're going to have a son. It took 13 years. That's a long time to be trusting God. But he ended up um, hooking up with Hagar and birthed Ishmael. Okay, and so it says... Uh, but he was, but he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. One translation says, for which things are an allegory. It says, and that's also very important because understand that some of the things that happened in the Old Testament 
are allegories. This is really the heart of all typology. What happened in the Gospel of Luke when Jesus said, you know, beginning at Moses and, and going through, you know, all the prophets and the Psalms, he revealed everything concerning himself. And so there are deeper truths within the stories of the Word of God that really paint the picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the new man, you know, the old man, um, the pictures of the kingdom of darkness, you know, uh, pictures of, like I said, the new covenant and the old covenant. And this is one of those allegoric examples Paul actually shines some light on, hey, this is a story in the Old Testament, but it symbolized something. And it says so, for these are the two covenants. So one covenant, Hagar and her son, Ishmael, and then the other covenant, Sarah, Sarah and Isaac, they represent two covenants. And it says the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Okay, this is the law. It says, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Okay, but the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, and he gives, this is out of Isaiah 54, it says, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. And so symbolically, this is talking about Sarah, symbolically, okay, the new covenant. It says, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. So Sarah was not in labor because she was barren. It says, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Okay, so you've got, of course, like I said, Hagar, you know, there, there are more children of the flesh. There are more children that are not the promised seed than there are that are that are of the promise and it says now we brethren as isaac was our children of promise notice isaac's birth was supernatural okay first of all it was given by promise okay and it was literally through a miracle that isaac was born it took the supernatural divine intervention of god on behalf of behalf of Sarah for this birth to occur being born again is also symbolic of this because it is totally it is first of all it is acquired through a promise fulfilled and it is dependent upon the grace and the power of God and it says but as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit even so it is now think about it Okay, the Jews who were, you know, born of the flesh, they said, you know, we have Abraham as, I, as our, our father, okay, persecuted the Christians, okay, the early church who were being born again, spilt, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit, okay, there, there was a war between the religious community, those who were trying to follow the law, those that were in bondage, okay, those that were the children of the flesh trying to achieve righteousness through the flesh and they were persecuting believers who were basically proclaiming righteous the righteousness of god through faith in jesus christ and the righteousness you know that is by faith and those that were being born again through the promise of the holy spirit and it says nevertheless what does the scripture say Okay, this is a quote. It says, Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So, as soon as, like I said, so you got Isaac rolls into the picture, and so you've got the two, you've got the two uh, sons, and the scripture says, cast out the bondwoman and her son. So that's the children of the flesh. And, and in many ways, like I said, I mean, that represents the world. It also re represents everybody who's religious. It, depend it, it corresponds to everybody who rejects Christ, okay? 
they are not going to be heirs with Christ in in the on the new earth during the millennial reign or even in the age to come. Okay, those that reject Christ, those that try to attain righteousness or salvation through works, through the works of the law, through trying to be good enough, are not going to inherit eternal life and they persecute those who live by faith um that's why paul got so much backlash um so i'm just going to i'm just going to cut it yeah i'm just going to cut it right here i'm, I'm not going to go on to chapter five here okay but like i said this this is so this scripture this passage of scripture is so eye-opening because yet again it it may because i've look i read i'm pretty sure yeah i'm pretty sure i read this story in genesis prior to reading um you know this uh this revelation of what this represents and this is probably one of the things that i'm sure that either the holy spirit you know, revealed to Paul directly, or, you know, because, like I said, he, Paul was taught of Jesus, you know, uh, he, he had an experience with Jesus, and so, either Jesus revealed this to him directly, or the Holy Spirit revealed this to him prophetically, because otherwise, when you read, when you go back and read this story, while you're reading it, it was a literal story that took place, and so there's just no way when you read it, you're like, oh yeah, this represents the old covenant, this represents the new covenant, and, you know, we are represented by, you know, the children of Isaac. Like, you don't get that, you know? I mean, it, this has to be something that God revealed. And so there are many things in the New Testament that the Bible does reveal. And what's awesome is, is that I mean, look, the old the Old Testament, I mean, look, I'm I'm just going to show you real quick just by just by example here cuz I've got I'm 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 actually literally reading out of a Bible here. Okay, but but so let, let's just let's just look at it. Okay, so this over here is the New Testament. Okay, pretty small. This over here is the Old Testament, very big. I mean, it's like massively th I mean, it's got to be at least at least 3 times as much content and so and you see how long it's gotten me to get through like four you know four chapters in one little letter okay what i'm saying is is that there is so much symbolism in the old testament these were real stories okay i mean you've got you know of course i mean some real history but what's so beautiful is is that this history it is a depiction there are things in this word that are so prophetic of, like I said, the ministry of Christ, the whole purpose of Jesus coming on the earth, so prophetic of our position. Trust me, things things end up making sense. I mean, and it will make the word of God exciting because as you're reading it, you know, you're, 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 it's like you're alert. Like, it's almost like, where's Waldo? I mean, it's like, you're looking at a picture, but it's like, instead of looking for Waldo, like you're looking for Christ, you know? And sometimes, you know, when I'm reading and I'm listening, you know, I'm specifically listening for where is the church? Where is the born again believer? Where is the new covenant believer? Where is the new creation in this? Where is, like, I'm, I'm searching diligently because I have this understanding through this passage of scripture that these stories are symbolic and you know and and there are allegories that are hidden within the stories of the old testament and they all pertain to something that i can understand god on a deeper level and trust me like it's it's so beautiful you're just like wow i mean one of the oldest prophecies just as an example um one of the most prophetic things that and this is just i'll just go ahead and give you this one for free i could i could spend hours and hours this is, i'm telling you i love i love talking about you know deliverance i love talking about talking about healing but 
two things that get me really excited because I love math. Um, two things that get me excited are numbers in the Bible. I just, I love it. And trust me, like, I've just recently even started learning about numbers and the Bible and what they symbolize. Like, I've understood it to an extent, but I haven't done, like, you know, I haven't gotten obsessive, you know, in learning about it in, in and out. And then, but I'm telling you, it is, it is mind-blowing. It will, it just, I mean, it just, I don't, I, I get so excited just thinking about it. Um, and then, of course, like I said, typology. Typology has got to be my absolute favorite thing in the whole Bible, uh, which, like I said, this allegory is an example of typology, because yet again, so remember, Hagar and the bond, and if you haven't read the book, if you haven't read this in the book of Genesis, I understand, like, it's not, it's not going to mean as much, because you haven't read the full story, you know, but yeah, so Hagar and Ishmael, which, by the way, Ishmael, okay, Ishmael is where literally all of the Arab nations came out of. So that's one of the reasons why like Islam, um, Islam ties back to Abraham. And so pretty much what Islam teaches is that instead of Isaac being the promised seed, they say that Ishmael it was the promised seed. So this is where the Jews and the the Arabs disagree. Um, but I was just going to give you this one, and I'll end this after the, after this. But so, in the Garden of Eden, okay, after Adam and Eve had sinned, all right, they clothed them. They clothed themselves with fig leaves. Now, fig leaves symbolically in the Bible always represents self-righteousness it is man trying to take care of their sin on their own trying to become righteous through their own means so that's what fig leaves represent that's why when jesus um cursed you know the uh fig tree uh in the gospels you know read about it in the gospel of mark there's one account of it but when you see that it is a picture of self-righteousness. It is a picture of the church, a, per, a picture of the believer. And Jesus says, you know, he curses it and says, no fruit grow from you forever, you know. And so there is no fruit in self-righteousness. And like I said, it is not good to be a fruitless believer because there is some, some strong strong negative connotation tied to it but so after after they closed themselves with the fig leaves it says that god took animal skins and he closed them and this was a this was the the typology here is god was going to take a sacrifice so in this case the animal sacrifice we know because of the scriptures everybody has heard jesus is the lamb of god and so Jesus being the Lamb of God was the sacrifice in which, okay, God was going to provide his own sacrifice and then clothe his children in his righteousness. Not clothe them in animal skins, but clothe them in the, you know, the Bible talks about, you know, it says, um, we actually just read it. Um, it says that those that have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. And so this was a picture of us putting on Christ. Okay, God God, killing his sacrifice. Okay, his Lamb of God, Jesus. And then clothing us with his righteousness. And this is one of the earliest prophecies. It was one of the most prophetic things that God did at the very beginning and thousands of years later, we can look back at the very beginning of creation and say, I see what you did there. But it doesn't just start or end there. You can go all throughout the Bible and find these examples. I'll give you another one for free. Noah and the ark. Okay. Jesus is the ark. How are people saved? They had to get in the ark. Okay. And if you were in the ark, you were safe 
from judgment, the water, if you read in First Peter, that water was symbolic of baptism, okay? And so what happened in baptism, think about it. Wickedness was drowned, okay? The wickedness perished, all right? So I, well, it's not even a belief, it's just a fact. Real biblical baptism, okay? Demons are real. Period of the end. Demons are real. I mean, that's there. There should really, this shouldn't even really be a discussion. I mean, if you're watching this Bible study, if you believe in the Bible, you have to believe in demons. I mean, you have to believe in a devil. I mean, the devil is not some symbolic entity. He's a real entity. I mean, Paul writes about demons. Uh, Peter. Jude, um, James mentions the demonic, Jesus teaches about evil spirits, like, it is just a biblical reality, and so, the wicked being perished by water, this is a picture of baptism, so real true biblical baptism literally has the ability to cleanse you from demonic forces, which is one of the reasons why Jesus said those that are baptized will be saved. That word saved also means delivered. So those that are baptized will be saved. Part of salvation is not just getting to heaven, but it also represents and means getting set free of the demons. Okay, washing that away. And so you've got the waters of Noah representing water baptism. You've got the wicked perishing and through baptism you can have deliverance of evil spirits and the powers of darkness being flooded and then believers being in the ark jesus represents the ark and being safe the door being sealed whenever the door was shut and sealed the the ark of noah that was a picture of us the bible talks about us getting sealed by the holy spirit so that whole demonstration, yes, the flood of Noah was real, the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of, uh, or Noah's Ark was real, and, but that symbolically represented the believer, New Testament, New Covenant believer, being sealed with the Holy Spirit, being set free of wickedness, and being saved and delivered from the judgment of God, and being safe and secure in Christ. And so, I'm telling you, I mean, I'm not, obviously that this whole video is not about typology, but I just wanted to, to share with you guys some examples of typology and how exciting it is because literally just about every single story in the Bible has little Easter egg nuggets of truth and understanding that will deepen your faith and deepen your understanding of the plans of God and what he intended for his body of believers. So I hope this has been blessed. I'm going to obviously have to make the last part of this. Hopefully we can cover the rest of this. But if you like this, um, I'm telling you, subscribe. I'm going to be doing all kinds of Bible studies. I mean, I absolutely live, I live for this. Honestly, I can talk about the Bible literally 24-7, all day long, all day, all night long. I study, eat, breathe, sleep the Word of God. I don't get bored. I don't get tired. I literally only get strengthened and encouraged and get stronger in the Lord. So... God bless, in Jesus' name.